What, what's your date of birth? 228, 24. So you're just a child? Yeah. I went to first grade in Ludlow, and then my dad, uh, we couldn't, my dad couldn't find a good job, and we moved to Gowanda, and I went through, I, I went, I lived in Gowanda until I graduated, and then I came to Jamestown to get a job, and that was in 1941. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. In them days it was no big thing. We didn't realize how big that was until, you know, after that. Yeah, sure, I remember. And did you remember uh, much about it? Did the family talk about it? Did your friends talk about it? Yeah. What did they say? Oh. They were all, you know, very angry at the Japanese because, uh, you know, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and all the lives that were lost there. And uh, and most of the young guys like me were all anxious to get in the service and, you know, enlist and go to war. People were real dedicated. No, I enlisted. And what service did you get into? Marine Corps. That was supposed to be a tough outfit and that's probably why I wanted to get into it. I was sworn in in uh, December 1942, and then I went on active duty in uh, January 1943. Where did you do your basic training? Paris Island. Paris Island? And a young kid out of high school, and he go in there like a boy, freckle face, and when you get in there, boy, in, in about six to eight weeks, you're a different person when you come <laughs> out. We went in. Uh, in boot camp, they bring you in on these big trucks, and everybody that's that's already in Paris on, they're all hollering that you'll be sorry. I want to tell you something about boot camp that it's real strange. Sure. When you go in boot camp, there any, anything you've got on you, everything you take off, you take everything off, anything you've got of any value to you is sent back to your parents. You want to see? Uh, what some of these kids from Chicago had them. Homemade knives and brass knuckles and stuff. But you know, as tough as those street kids were, <laughs> that Marine Corps boot camp was tougher. Yeah. It was strange how these kids come from all walks of life. Some of them never had no shoes on like that. From south, down south, they were barefooted. It was amazing what, how they turned them into that. Yeah, I was the first one on the platoon they get trouble. They they treat you how to make teach you how to make your bed, mm -hmm. and the corners have got to be square. Well, mine wasn't, and he tore my bed all apart and threw it <laughs> on the floor and kicked it a little bit. But lucky, my uh, the guy up over in the bunk above me was a CC guy, and he knew how to. They made him do that CC camp, and he showed me how to do it. And then I had no trouble no more. <laughs> and then after that. I went to a school in California, in Inglewood, for B-25, uh, B-25 school. Me and another kid did something, I think, I can't remember what it was, it was nothing major. We come back late from Liberty, and I got in trouble, me and my buddy over that, and the captain called me in the office and gave me a choice of doing something or sending me over. See, that's how really I got sent over. Really? <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah, I go overseas. I wanted to go anyway, so so did the other guy. And I got sent overseas, and uh, we got sent to Honolulu, Hawaii. But halfway halfway between ha ha San Pedro, where we shipped out of in Arizona, we hit a violent storm, mm. real bad. And this troop ship I was on was a well, they called it a Liberty ship, but actually we called it a jeep carrier. It was a small version of the aircraft carrier. And it was a whole bunch of planes up on the deck and we hit a bad storm. And we lost a couple guys uh, that went out on the deck and the chief warned them not to go and they got washed overboard and we never found them. It, it pulled a lot of the seams apart on the ship, right. broke all the dishes in the galley and so we were lucky to get to Hawaii. And then from Hawaii, we were only there a short time and I got sent to Midway Island. And we spent a short time there. 
Oh, and then I come back to the States and then I got shipped, uh, I got shipped over to uh, the Marshall Islands. There was like three major battles in uh, the Marshalls. There was Inui Talk and Kwajalein and then on a, the other little island I was on called Injibi. Mm -hmm. We wanted that Injibi island real bad for a uh, airstrip. Right. Yeah, we made a landing on uh, Injibi. Injibi. And we made a landing there and we learned how to come down them cargo nets and get in the Higgins boat and that's real tricky. Wow. The captain of the ship was a merchant marine guy and he was real tough. He's so, screaming and hollering at the chief there. It was on the edge of the deck there to get these damn marines off his ship quicker because uh, he's worried about getting torpedoed with a Japanese ship. Because there's a lot of... Uh, there was a lot of submarines in that area. We, we went in on this island, got off the Higgins boats, and it's pitch dark, and there's no place to go. You can't light any lights. Some guy had a radio, I, th I think it was one of the officers, and he tuned in this Tokyo Rose. Hello, Yankee brothers. This is your Japanese sister, the voice of truth. The voice Tokyo of truth Rose reaches out to you from the peacefulness of Japan. Laden, as always, with love, but today also with sorrow because of what your superiors are making you do. This morning they are forcing you to attempt the impossible. Is that Tokyo Rose? Brothers? Yeah, I guess so. The impossible. And no accident. For it is impossible for you to dislodge our forces on Iwo Jima. Iwo Jima? She's got the straight force. dope. I am filled with sadness for you. She knew all about that island, and she says, you Marines that uh, secured that island are in for a little fun, because we're going to come back. And the next, and the next night, they, they come in and they, they bombed us and scraped us real bad. Mm. And it's a funny thing, it, it's dark, but they, they dropped a lot of these little parachutes. And they had, I don't know if that was magnesium or what run them, but but they lit up like the island was daylight. And then them Betty bombers come in and the outer planes and they bombed us good and straight us and they, on the end of the island there was a great big supply of aviation fuel. That's what they were after and they, they bombed that and oh my word. that went on. They killed a few guys around that. That's a that's funny Tokyo Rose how well informed she was and everything that went on. Did you guys listen to her much? Once in a while, it, somebody had tuned it in. Well, we did that night. Yeah. How interesting, because she would normally play music and, you know, be nice. Yeah, and she was educated over here, I guess, as far as I know. Wow. What was your reaction when that all happened? I mean, among the troops, how did you guys feel? Yeah, that was a scary situation. There was no place to hide. And when they dropped them flares all over, they first they sent a scout plane in. Mm -hmm. And then he dropped some of them flares and so did them other. But it's amazing that island's not very big, but they lit it up like it's almost daylight. Yeah. Actually, when we landed there, uh, a lot of the Japanese had been killed, but there was some on the end of the island was still living. Right. They had to get rid of them. Were they in caves or was that... Uh... They used to have their own bunkers, usually made out of coconut logs. Really? You know, it's amazing. They shell those islands. The Navy shells all them islands before you land on them. And if you'd think they'd never stop, and you'd think they'd kill every Japanese on that island, but by God, they didn't. Okay. Somehow underneath them bunkers they had and coconut logs, they survived. Yeah, a lot of guys got real bad dysentery. Where was this? That was on Injibi. They, Them dead bodies laid around, you know, for several days before we got a chance to bury them. Get a dozer in there to bury them. We had to bury over a thousand Japanese. The Seabees come in with a big D9 dozer. They dug a big hole and they buried them all right in the, on that island. The Japanese, they didn't bother with things. I was there 18 months. 18 almost months. Eight, almost 18 months. And basically our job there was uh, repairing and checking damaged plane, carrier planes for the Navy. Mm -hmm. They'd bring them in on a barge and sometime if they were flyable, they'd fly them in. And then of course we had to repair them. And, and you, you have a lot of you have a lot of authority when you're in the service. I was a a staff sergeant, but I had authority to look at one of those 
planes off the deck of one of those carriers that was damaged. We'd look at the, the fuselage and everything, and I had the authority to, if I, if I said that thing wasn't repairable, that was it. I didn't have to go to an officer or something. They load a lot of responsibility on you. When we first went on that island, there was, uh, there was no food. We lived on them rations for a long, long time. And we never had no barracks. We slept in the tent until I got out of there. But the Seabees would sneak us food. You know, the regular food. <laughs> Once in a while they'd send in some hams or whatever. And dr our drinking water would come in cans. Until they finally found a way out of the ocean to, right. to purify it. And, yeah, you don't think about that. Wow. We wore the clothes we landed in until they rotted off. They would, and just put on clean ones and you went out in the ocean to get some of the smell off you. But we were surprised because some guys had some bar soap. It doesn't work in salt water. No. And they go out there and scrub and it was really funny because the guys are wondering, what the hell's the matter with the soap? I never knew that. That was not something you don't think about. No. A lot of times these fighter planes would, uh, like the F-4, F-4 uh, Corsair, would, could carry a heavy bomb under each wing. Well, every once in a while, one of them wouldn't let go. They'd get rid of one and not the other. A lot of times when they landed, them bombs would skid right down the runway. And oh, they'd yeah. scatter all over hell. But they won't go off till they're detonated. Boy, that would scare everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and then another time, we had another pilot. We had a pilot there. He. Uh, he wasn't watching what he's doing, and the CBs were uh, putting an apron or a runway along there, and he taxied the plane into it. It caused a lot of damage to that new fighter plane. Yeah. Oh, he got out screaming and hollering and, and uh, hollered at the guy, and then he uh, went after the line chief, who was a master sergeant. Well, the line chief was like, a, like these uh, authors on a carrier. If they tell you, you never, he's in charge of that runway, not even the CO can has jurisdiction over him. And boy, did he get hell for that, for, for over trying to use his rank on that line chief. Yeah. And the captain Riley grounded him for 30 days for he taxied his plane into the, the poor CB guy. Lucky he didn't get killed. Yeah, I got it. There are a lot of incidents that happened there. Before we come back, the, Marine, the Marines were going on him invade Okinawa, which is a large island. And we could see the task force from Njibi. It was one after another big troop ships going there. Well, they figured they were going to have trouble there, so we were going to be back up and we were going to go to Okinawa. But because we've been overseas for so long, they changed their mind and sent us back at the last minute. Well, we got all cracked up, ready to go, and then they changed their mind. Uh, from over there, I, I went to a, a large air base in North Carolina called Cherry Point. So after you came back from Injibi, you came back to the States? Back to the States, yeah. The Japanese have accepted our terms fully. That's the word we've just received from the White House in Washington. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of the Second World War. So when you finally get the word through the probably the loudspeaker or something that the they Japanese got, surrender. How did you guys react? Oh boy, that was a celebration and everybody was happy. But you know, you don't brag about your branch of service, but everybody does about their, in the Marines or their SEALs or whatever, but I think that generation in World War II, instead of saying we were fighting the ISIS instead of the Japanese, it don't matter how ISIS, how strong or those guys are dedicated. They, there was nothing would stop them. Something about that generation was different than what it is today. That's what I noticed anyway. How long were you in the service then? Uh, from uh, that, when I enlisted on uh, in the 15th of December 42, I got the discharge on November 5th, 1945. 